Welcome, thank you for joining us for Obesity Care Week 2022, Now is the Time to Act. I am James Zervios, Obesity Action Coalition Vice President of Marketing and Communications, and today we have an engaging discussion planned with one of the most sought after experts in the field of obesity medicine. But before we get started, we would like to recognize all of our OCW 2022 supporters, and we would like to thank all of the champion organizations who are supporting us this week all across the world. And we'd like to thank all of our OCW 2022 partners, our bronze partner, Eli Lilly, our patron partner, Endo Pharma, and our supporting partners, Bowringer Ingelheim, Celebrate Nutritional Supplements, Curax Pharmaceuticals, Fujifilm, Intuitive Surgical, and Rhythm Pharmaceuticals. Thank you to all of our distinguished partners and champions. Without your support, Obesity Care Week would not be possible. When we hear the words weight loss or obesity treatment, we often get very mixed messages due to the amount of information out there. Unfortunately, there is a lot of misinformation when it comes to obesity treatment. And today, we are fortunate enough to have with us Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford to help break down this topic and help us better understand where we are with obesity treatment and where we're going in the future. Dr. Stanford is a fellowship-trained obesity medicine physician and scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Stanford. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm ready to make sure we have some action. Dr. Stanford, when it comes to treatments for obesity and severe obesity, we have medications, commercial programs, bariatric surgery, and more. With all of these tool tools at our disposal, why do you think we still struggle when it comes to addressing obesity? So I think this is a great question. We have so many treatment modalities, and I think the key reason why we struggle to get people um, in terms of using these treatment modal modalities um, to the way they need to be is that we still have yet to recognize obesity as a disease. Yes, the American Medical Association recognized obesity as a disease back in 2013, but there has been a slow trickle-down effect to both the medical population and to policymakers with regards to these issues. The reason why this is important is that if physicians and other healthcare providers are uneducated about obesity as a disease, how are persons going to be able to utilize these therapies that they're not being made privy to? I think that a lot needs to start at in the medical establishment in terms of educating medical students, residents, and faculty about the disease of obesity and about its treatment. We're educated about all other chronic diseases, you know, like diabetes or high blood pressure or sleep apnea. And so a general internist or pediatrician or family physician knows how to tackle those problems until they become really significant and severe and we get into the specialized world. Right now, in terms of treating obesity, there's so few of us that know how to delve into this wide range of treatment modalities that are available to treat patients that have moderate to severe obesity. And that is problematic. So I would say education needs to change. And then if we look at it from the policy angle, we really need to think about coverage of these different treatment modalities. We know that there's disparities in terms of obesity rates in certain groups, those with lower socio social determinants of health, for example, are gonna have lesser likelihood of having access to these modalities or therapies. It can be variations by state or insurance, et cetera. And a lot of that still goes back to this idea that obesity isn't consistently recognized for the disease that it is. And so I think that this is where we need to really focus our efforts recognizing obesity as a disease and the treatment modalities that are available based on the evidence, based in scientists, science that can be utilized for individuals that have this disease of obesity. Yeah, Dr. Stanford, I think you brought up so many interesting points there about um, being able to actually treat the disease, having people qualified to treat it, and really talking about this really, you know, in all stages of life. And, you know, people often start an obesity treatment and they don't see the results that they, I think they, th they think they might see or should see right away, right? And you may have people that are experiencing weight regain and something like that as well. <laughs> what would you tell uh, people that are just frustrated when it comes to, to addressing their weight? So I think first of all, patience is a key and it's a virtue <laughs> when we're talking about obesity. It is a chronic disease. So we can't anticipate that with any therapy that we try that automatically 
we will solve this chronic disease. And I think this goes back to our lack of understanding of obesity as a disease. If we think it's just something that you just eat less exercise more than, you know, we just fix the problem, then yeah, maybe we can fix it pretty quickly. But we know that this is a disease of the brain and we're trying to change how the brain sees weight. And that takes a lot of trial and error. So I have patients that I've been caring for that have been seen here for over a decade um, that have obesity. And in terms of our intensity of therapy, it waxes and wanes. And by that, I mean that we may have times of more intensity where we're meeting more frequently, let's say every three months. And there may be times when we're able to space that therapy, like meeting like, let's say every year, because where we are has, you know, we're able to achieve a certain amount of weight loss and stability. And so I think it's important to recognize that your care in obesity is a lifelong chronic therapy with varying levels of intensity, and there needs to be patients involved as we determine what are the best strategies and modalities to help you achieve the happiest, healthiest weight for you. Now, you talked in there about uh, having patients and um, you know making sure that you're, you're finding that best treatment option and talking to your provider. I think right. everyone begins their journey at a different point, right? And, and what would you tell someone right now who's watching this and is looking to take that first step? What's that first step they should take? So I think that the first step that someone should take if you have the disease will be is just recognize, number one, okay, I have this disease. And wait a minute, there are therapies available that I can utilize to address this disease, whether you struggled with it in more recent times, or maybe it's been a lifelong battle for you. We have treatments available and we have people that are trained to care for you. Once you've recognized that, I would begin to search in your local area for, let's say, obesity medicine physicians. There's ways to search um, the Obesity Action Coalition um, database to see who's in your area. You can also use the American Board of Obesity Medicine to search for physicians um, that are specifically trained to care for you and your disease of obesity. I think that's where you have to start to recognize first, this is a disease, second, there are people that treat it. Third, find one of those individuals and begin your journey. Yeah, I love there how you kind of frame that up, right? So they're gonna find the right person to talk to about this issue. And then, you know, I, I guess my next question, maybe a follow-up to that is, how would somebody prepare for that first conversation about their weight? I think sometimes we hear so much within the patient community that the experience when talking about weight can be very negative or there can be a lot of stigma that's fueled there. And maybe they're most likely not talking to an obesity medicine specialist in that situation. But if somebody feels that they found the right doctor, they've got the appointment, it's, you know, it's coming up in two weeks, how can that person prepare for that first appointment? So that's a really great question. And I think there's some variation in how we practice. So I'll have to like give it to you from like my vantage point. What I would want if you were coming in to see me um, like I saw a new patient for the first time today. Um, I would say first, like kind of do some deep dive in learning about this disease that is obesity. If you can learn a little bit about that, maybe you can listen to one of my lectures on the topic and just kind of educate yourself because you'll be surprised that what you thought was the, the status quo for weight and weight regulation is probably incorrect. And so knowing that information helps inform you on how you can address that appointment with that obesity medicine physician or other healthcare provider. Um, once you, you've done that kind of deep dive, that knowledge, maybe looking at this, you know, like um, podcasts and things or listening to podcasts and looking at lectures to help prepare you, then you can be informed of like all of the treatment strategies that might be utilized to help address your obesity recognizing that we use many of these in combination with each other, not necessarily all, you know, starting on day one, but that we can use multiple treatment modalities and find them to be complementary um, to one another. Um, I would find out um, if you need laboratory studies um, to fully assess you. Um, many of the guidelines, including the guidelines that I rely on most um, which are the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the Obesity Society guidelines, many of these do um, require that you get a fasting lab set prior to your initial visit that can be explored um, with your physician or other healthcare provider at that initial visit. The reason why I find that to be important um, is because it helps me to understand you in the context of not just the weight on this, the weight that we see on the scale or even your waist circumference, which we're often taken. It gives me a sense of what your metabolic health is like. And 
I couple all of those together to guide the conversation about what treatment modality might be the initial step and what additional treatment might, modalities might be necessary as we continue the journey together. Yeah, so I think some key takeaways there is, you know, we got to make sure what are, what are the expectations from the provider? Do you need to have labs prepared for that? And then also as a patient, having real ex realistic expectations about addressing, you know, your weight as well. And you touched on, on a topic there uh, about, you know, just in healthcare in general. So right. I think somebody like you, you've, you've been doing this for, for a long time. You're an expert in, in obesity treatment, right? Well, but if we talk to healthcare providers in general, because I did mention, you know, a, a minute ago that, that we often hear that, unfortunately, healthcare is one of the areas where weight bias is the most prevalent. So mm -hmm. if, you could, if you could speak to all healthcare providers out there today, you know, they, we know they're on the front lines as well. We know that they're working with people that have obesity and they may not even be there to talk about their weight. It might be there for something completely different. What would you say to healthcare providers that are interacting with people with obesity? Maybe to, you know, have a little bit more compassion or what, what advice could, could you give them? I'm going to start in, in the same way that I started with, with kind of a previous question is number one, obesity is a disease. If obesity is a disease, we have to treat this patient population with the same level of respect and dignity that we give with other disease processes. Stop blaming the patient. Don't assume that just because someone comes in with severe obesity that they have poor dietary habits or they're inactive or whatever other presumptions you might have that are based upon your explicit bias towards those that have the disease of obesity. Check your biases at the door. If you don't know your biases as a healthcare provider, there's a tool for that. I would encourage you to take the weight implicit association test. And that is available free of charge here at Harbor for you to take it and get a sense of, do I harbor both implicit or explicit bias towards those that have obesity? And if you do, begin to recognize it because it, I can guarantee you that it is affecting the care that that patient population is receiving from you. It's unacceptable and we have to do better. So let's pretend that we could jump forward into the future. It's okay. year 2032, we're having okay. this discussion again. It's Obesity Care Week 2032, we're having this discussion. Yeah. What okay, does- I'm, So I'm saying, I'm hearing that I'm being invited back in 2032 to- In 2032, this? you have a spot okay. here. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it, if you could fast forward 10 years from now, yeah. what does obesity treatment look like for somebody with obesity? What would I like? My hypothetical, what would I like? Yes. It to be? Yeah, in a perfect world, what would it look like? Oh, perfect world. Oh, in a perfect world. Um, <laughs> we would actually recognize obesity disease and there would be full coverage of all of the evidence-based treatment modalities that are available. Let's say they are similar to the, the ones we have now, which include lifestyle, behavioral, medication, device, surgery. There would be full access to this entire armamentarium of treatment modalities that are um, commonplace in terms of treating the disease of obesity. Congress would recognize obesity as the disease that it is and would take away um, certain provisions that block dietary therapy with dietitians and or pharmacotherapy coverage for obesity. There would be less disparities in terms of the rates of obesity, particularly um, amongst racial and ethnic minority communities here in the United States because of the better access to treatment. In addition, it would be commonplace to be educated about the disease of obesity in medical schools, residencies and fellowships in the US. In addition to that, also in NP schools, with nurse practitioner schools, PA schools, so that the front line is better trained, not only to speak respectfully, to treat um, these individuals with dignity, but actually to know how to provide meaningful change so that they get to the happiest, healthiest weight for them. Well, Dr. Stanford, I think that absolutely sounds perfect. Uh, I think if we have a world like that in the next five to 10 years, I think we're gonna be oh. a lot, a lot better off. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us during Obesity Care Week 2022. We greatly appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me and I can't wait to come back for 2032. <laughs> thank you. Before we close today, we would like to once again thank all of our supporting champions and we would like to thank our partners our bronze partner, Eli Lilly, our patron partner, Endopharma, and supporting partners, Bowringer Ingelheim, Celebrate Nutritional Supplements, Curax Pharmaceuticals, Fujifilm, Intuitive Surgical, and Rhythm Pharmaceuticals. 
And if you haven't yet visited the Obesity Care Week website and learned how you can take action now, please do so by visiting obesitycareweek.org. Now is the time to act. Thank you very much. Have a good day.